Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andre Petrão, or Andre, the more accessible and shorter version. And I am, as most of you probably know, a postdoctoral researcher at the Lab of Architecture, Criticism, History, and Theory here at the EPFL. And it is my huge pleasure to be your moderator this evening. And I'm especially thrilled to do so in an edition of 2020 with these two speakers, which the EPFL is honored to host as visiting professors this year. Professor Jean-Louis Cohen, who is teaching architecture of the Russian avant-garde, and Dr. Irina Davidovici, who is teaching Swiss cooperative housing, a critical overview. Both have been invited to give a small um, uh, lecture of 20 minutes each, which will be followed by an additional 20 minutes during which you, the audience, will be invited to ask questions and join an open discussion. Feel free to write your questions in the chat box during the presentation and the discussion, either in English or in French. We will begin with uh, Professor Jean-Louis Cohen, renowned architect and historian. Professor Cohen has studied, uh, studied architecture at the École Spéciale d'Architecture in Paris and received a PhD in art history from the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in 1985. He was since um, uh, direct, uh, he since directed the architectural research program of the Ministry of Public Works before holding a chair at the Paris Villemont School of Architecture and then the chair of history of cities and the French uh, at the French Institute of Urban Planning at the University of Paris 8. In 1994, he was appointed professor in the history of architecture at the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. From 1997 to 2003, the Ministry of Culture of France entrusted him uh, with the creation of the Cité de l'Architecture et du Patrimoine in Paris, which opened in 2007. His research has mostly concerned 20th century architecture and urban planning, particularly Le Corbusier, German and Soviet architectural cultures and North African colonial conditions in World War II, and has taken the form of numerous exhibitions, namely at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and at the Centre Georges Pompidou and also in the form of multiple books, most recently and published this year, Building a New World, a Mechanism in Russian Architecture. Professor Cohen, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, very happy to be with you, with, between quotation marks, to be with you today. And uh, without further ado, I will, since time is really uh, limited, I will uh, go straight to the point. Uh, I've published in uh, 2020 uh, no less than four books. This is, of course, crazy. Some of these books take a very short time to do, others take years and years. Uh, the one I will discuss today, uh, it took me some five years and is the, is the first one of a series devoted to the work of an architect I, I, uh, I'm extremely fond of, an architect I've met, I first met 40 years ago in 1981, Frank Gehry. And this book is of a particular kind. It is the first volume of a catalogue raisonné of the drawings of a man who can, who arguably has uh, uh, transformed the practice of architecture in a, in a major way. No wonder he was, for instance, featured uh, in 1997 uh, with this famous advertising campaign by his clients, Chat and Day, among uh, the great uh, thinkers of the 20th century, such as Picasso, Einstein, etc. So Gary has reshaped or recast our thinking of what a house is, what a house should be, what a house can be with his own residence in Santa Monica. He has also famously uh, re, uh, recast the, the very notion of what a museum can be, what how it operates, what is its relationship to the uh, to the city. So. Um, knowing Frank, I was really excited when the uh, house of Kayedar approached me uh, some five or six years ago to work on his production. Kayedar had been created in 1926 by Christian Zervos, whom you see on the right, and had uh, published uh, continuous issues on architecture, art, uh, anthropology, etc and visual culture from the 20s to the 60s. 
Carriada also published a catalogue raisonné of Picasso's paintings. So there was sort of house brand which um, led when the publisher was re, uh, restarted, rebooted uh, some uh, six or seven years ago by uh, a new uh, owner, this led to a new policy in terms of these kind of projects. The first one was undertaken by my friend Yves Alain Bois and deals with the work of Ellsworth Kelly in painting. And uh, thinking about a possible uh, architectural project, we, with Stefan Arenberg, the publisher, we decided that the only possible one was, besides Alvaro Siza perhaps, was uh, Frank Gehry. Uh, since we were adamant at focusing on drawings, on architects' drawings and not on computers' drawings or other kind of uh, graphic evidence. So this is the origin of this book, which is uh, weighs nine pounds and is, uh, as you see here, uh, based on a sequence of 75 uh, designs or buildings, which are discussed in all uh, in the Genesis and uh, which are documented by the study sketches, uh, which were uh, often relatively easy to find as they had been kept in flat drawers, some very concrete here in the Gary office, sometimes kept in tubes, sometimes had to be found in hundreds of tubes, which I had to go through uh, during these years. Uh, so this is a small view of what uh, uh, the mine uh, I had to dig through uh, looked like in uh, Gary's office in Venice, California. So the span of the project is, is ample. Uh, it starts this first volume, first of eight volumes, presumably, starts with Frank's um, architect thesis of 1954, which is sort of orthodox 1950s uh, uh, architect's design. And it continues through his first uh, built uh, apartment house in Santa Monica in 1962, which uh, was, uh, was already remarked because of its uh, a playful relationship with what Rainer Banhams had called the dingbats, the big buildings of Southern California, uh, a sort of camouflage act in which the big boxy building is hidden behind a roof, which brings some contextuality. So, and then from that moment onwards, uh, what I've documented is, is the first part of Gary's trajectory in which he uh, develops uh, interesting themes in purely commercial architecture. Here is a sheet I really love, which is very visible in the book, dealing with commercial architecture, small stores. Here is a big department store, which he developed for Joseph Magnin. Gary had been trained in this kind of architecture by Victor Grun, as you probably know, the inventor of the shopping mall and had a, and learned a lot with Victor Grun. This is also what I'm discussing in the book, how Victor Grun, the the team working of Grun, the focus on inexpensive materials, the focus, the integration of design features like in this tree where lighting, hangers, visual communication uh, are in, 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 arranged in a single in a single piece of design. So the, exper the commercial experience of Gary uh, led him to ex extremely interesting developments also in the architecture of museums and art galleries. Uh, the early projects of Gary are and his team, Gary and his partner, Greg Walsh, who was coming also from the uh, uh, studio uh, from the firm of, of Grun. They looked for language during those years, for instance, tr trying to emulate the Southern Californian experiments of uh, Rudolf Schindler on the right in this project for the deserts so or looking very closely at the work of Frank Lloyd Wright and especially at Japan, but they were, and this is what, what really transpires in this first volume, they, the team of Gary and Gary personally started looking very closely at the vernacular architecture of Los Angeles, at what is locally called the dump boxes, boxes for commercial buildings which line up the main avenues. And this is the third pro project in which this particular uh, Angelino language is uh, rediscovered and in a way uh, uh, made elegant by, by Gary in this commercial building. Uh, the following one is uh, better known, uh, the Danziger studio uh, 
uh, Hausen Studio also looked back at uh, some modernist episodes, the work of Irving Gill on the right, but developed uh, a more, a, a still more refined language. And, and the study of this, uh, the design of this project is really discussed in great detail in the book. Uh, one also sees uh, how Gary uh, started on the base of this project, socializing with artists, with Los Angeles artists and building for them. This is the Ron Davis house in Malibu of 1972, which is predominantly featured on this page of architectural record in 76, the first national uh, discussion of Gary's work in which he makes a couple of very interesting statements. Gary, and this is important to say, uh, I don't have a corpus of books as you know, Le Corbusier published 75 books, Mies probably 75 essays. Gary gave 750 interviews, but probably wrote no more than four very short essays in his entire life. So he had to deal with uh, wor written words, but in, in his correspondence and very few printed, very little uh, printed evidence. Here it's ver very important statement uh, of Gary in this period. I'm confused as to what's ugly and what's pretty. So this complete subversion of the uh, uh, accepted aesthetic values in Los Angeles uh, is a very significant turn in his practice. Uh, another turn is the focus on inexpensive materials. Uh, uh, cheap skate architecture was the title of lecture he gave in French. I would translate it as une architecture de radin. Uh, an architecture of very poor means, which he started uh, producing during these years. Another theme which uh, uh, filters through the book in, in great detail is Gary's relationship with art in general, artists as uh, friends, artists as clients, but also the art gallery as a, as a laboratory. He worked for the Los Angeles County Museum and installed a series of shows during these years from Japanese works to uh, to constructivism. He also worked with some artists and failed to uh, produce uh, a significant work. This was the case of a project he worked on for Ed Roche, which uh, uh, went nowhere. Roche uh, was being not ready to accept Frank's, uh, Frank's ideas. I've worked uh, also on, um, uh, published many, many sketches of Gary's forays into furniture design, which was probably the first part of his work, which uh, gave him visibility in the US. And one can follow uh, the selection of sketches I've made, which are organized according to the chronology of a project when I've been able to, uh, when I've been able to document it, are really uh, uh, allows to understand how ideas come up and are, are developed with some problems. And I won't hide one of the problems, which is the, that uh, Frank and his partner, Greg Walsh, uh, had taught each other to draw exactly in the same manner. So it, it, it was sometimes impossible to try to attribute one drawing to Frank or his partner, and they sometimes remembered, sometimes not. So there are some areas of mystery still in these pages. Mystery also in what Frank and, and, and Greg uh, try to do in the, in the late 60s. Uh, I've mentioned the echo of fright. Here it's more the echo of Franchon in this house for a, st for a sculptor uh, in, uh, uh, in the woods above Los Angeles. This went nowhere. And finally, I want to insist on two aspects of Frank's uh, work and production during those years. First of all, the significance of urban design. Frank had, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say an obsession, but a passion for urban form and had worked on, for, on, on, on uh, urban projects for Grun and during his stay in Paris in 1960. And he, uh, he, he designed a, a really very fascinating project for downtown Santa Monica in the late 70s. This is one of the sketches of a, a large version of a project which was scaled down and led him uh, to work on the visual communication uh, articulated to architecture. Here you see the, some of the many, many sketches uh, I've found and I'm reproducing of, his, uh, of the graphic design for the building uh, and more sketches showing how he worked with 
one of these uh, low cost, inexpensive and prosaic materials in chain link in order, in order to create visual effects, in order to achieve spectacular effects. And this is what led him to his house of 1978 uh, after a cycle in which he introduced a new uh, process in his design, which is thoroughly documented in this volume, which I can call the process of fragmentation of the domestic program. Here you see one, probably the first project in which the building is decomposed in discrete units, uh, which are then assembled together. This is an unbuilt project. Of course, something you can do in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles, probably not in Minneapolis or in uh, Oslo. Um, one of the most important projects in this perspective is the Jung Institute. And it's no wonder if it's very Corbusian sketch, one would almost see the, the platonic volumes of Le Corbusier under the Californian sky. No wonder if this is one of the very few drawings which are missing from the archive because Gary gave, him, gave it as a present to Philip Johnson. Final slides, two more, three more. Uh, Gary's house in 1978 came at the end of this process and became a manifesto of many sorts. Uh, I found amazing sketches which uh, Gary himself had forgotten, which, in which, for instance, on the left, he tried to wrap the original bungalow uh, located on the site into a, a, a palisade, into uh, a wooden wall, which lo looks very much like uh, Alvar Alto's exhibition pavilions of the 1930s. And then we see how the, the, the more complex volume developed out of it. So I'm making many points about this house in, in the book, which need to be need to be read to be understood. And uh, I'm also publishing many of the uh, sketches which have been kept from from the, from the a very short uh, design process. So in in uh, in one word, and this is my last uh, slide. Uh, the book starts with Gary's thesis, is, is, um, concludes with uh, his house and a moment in which he, he reaches a certain level of celebrity, featured <clears throat> on magazines like Domus, invited to the Venice Biennale where he resists very firmly the, tempta the temptation of histor historicist postmodernist with his uh, uh, wood frame installation on the right. So we see in this period of, let's say, uh, uh, let's say uh, 25 years, uh, how uh, Gary invents himself, how he, he moves away from the cast of the commercial architecture of Los Angeles, also from the orthodoxy of the late modern architecture of the US in order to become a completely original uh, designer. So this is only part one of a very long movie. Uh, episode one, I had committed myself to make eight of them. Why eight? Because it's the magic fi figure of Le Corbusier's oeuvre complete. But um, given that Gary is continuing, is continuing firmly to produce today, I might have to, I might have to make nine, 10, 12 of them in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, compact overview of uh, the early formative drawings of uh, architecture, furniture, urban design of uh, Gary, or perhaps Walsh. Uh, sometimes there's a, it's a mystery, right? Uh, I'll be very curious to see how this might interact with our next presentation by Dr. Davidovici. Uh, senior researcher at the GTA Institute in ETH Zurich, where she leads the doctoral program in history and theory of architecture. Dr. Davidovici studied uh, in Bucharest and London, worked at the offices of Caruso St. John and uh, Herzog and de Mahon, and before uh, completing her master in philosophy in 2009. Later, she went on to complete her PhD in history and philosophy of architecture at the University of Cambridge. She is the author of the book, Forms of Practice, German-Swiss Architecture from 1980 to 2000, published in 2012 
and uh, republished in 2018, an editor of Colconery, Alan Colcon and uh, Bricolage to Myth in 2015. Last year, she obtained her habilitation at ETH with the thesis Collective Grounds, Housing Estates in the European City from 1865 to 1934. And her research um, straddles urban housing studies, uh, commons theory, and architectural history and criticism. Dr. Davido Vici, please welcome, and we're looking forward to your uh, talk. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Patrao. Um, let me first say how delighted I am to attend this uh, event. Uh, I think it's a wonderful format and it's a, it's a very nice initiative of Archizum that I appreciate uh, a lot. Um, let me just share the screen. Yeah, it's working well, Irina. It is working, very good. So um, the, the provisional title of this um, and the connection perhaps to Professor Cohen's um, uh, earlier presentation is historical work in and on architecture, which is actually a quote from uh, uh, a keynote that he gave at the um, um, EHN conference in Dublin in 2016. I was in the audience and um, I was intrigued by some of the statements. So when we, um, when we were invited to share this platform, um, I approached uh, Professor Cohen uh, thinking or asking if we could talk about history. And after a very productive discussion, we agreed that it's best to talk about history through the prism of our own research. So um, with this uh, short introduction, I'm making the passage from a more monographic, um, uh, uh, catalogue raisonné to, to, to um, a, a question of collective authorship of uh, particularly anonymous architecture, and that is uh, the architecture of housing, municipal housing in Paris. And um, as we know, the, the um, creation of the Saint-Dieu Rouge um, around Paris uh, in the 1918 to 1920s. Um, this, uh, this uh, paper um, is actually one chapter out of um, uh, my habilitation that uh, you mentioned. And um, I'm, I've been looking really at um, the origins of housing and, and, and the urban patterns that are created by standardized housing, um, how the configuration of nuclear family dwellings, uh, and the grouping into uh, multi-story urban ensembles uh, have impacted on the European city. And of course, so this is a comparative study um, that looks at a set of generic features of, of early housing. I was particularly interested in early housing because um, some of the, um, the patterns uh, that, uh, that we take for granted were crystallized at this point. Um, but uh, so this is a chapter that deals with Paris and of course it's, it's a very brief overview of it. Um, I also um, going to mention um, a work that I have done with students at ETH um, who have helped me with uh, fantastic drawings uh, in order to, to illustrate this, this uh, publication that will be upcoming next year. And for the Paris uh, case study, I have had the pleasure of working with Annabelle Fritches. So all the drawings that you see as new, new drawings um, uh, can be credited to, to her, but um, including this overview of the housing projects that, that um, are mentioned in the chapter. And um, this, this uh, synthetic drawings that really uh, documents what we could see a transitional stage in, in the, uh, in, in uh, what is normally summarized as a passage from uh, Lilo Alabar, uh, which is a formulation that legitimizes the disappearance of the street corridor and uh, the appearance of the modernist trope of high rise towers uh, separated by, by uh, free space. Um, and the chapter really looks at uh, the significance and the variety of the transitional models that results from the application of reform uh, housing um, onto the conventions of the perimeter block. 
and also in this overview, uh, one can record the passage from uh, the early reform housing that was uh, um, normally patronized by, uh, by uh, foundations, charitable foundations, uh, to the appearance of um, municipal housing very much under the pressure and the, the, the realization that um, um, philanthropy uh, will never fulfill the need for housing that was being felt at the in turn of the century Paris. So um, the Centure Périphérique um, is uh, so-called Centure Rouge uh, because of the, um, the ideological background of the creation of these ABMs to some extent, um, is, uh, uh, presents a set of very, very particular housing formations. Um, and if I have to uh, advance a hypothesis uh, about, about this work, is, is, is this um, what I call here the Osman's long shadow, the, how, how these uh, um, buildings uh, decades later are strangely redolent of, of the same formal range of, of uh, Osman's Paris um, and oscillating between standardization and repetition on the one hand and uh, a kind of aesthetic ambition and civic ambition on the other. Of course, it's understandable why uh, Osman's shadow would be long indeed. Um, um, the, the sheer scale of, of uh, building uh, in this time is, is staggering, and particularly um, the, the streets that are built uh, at this time that act very much as a caesura in the, in the fabric of the city. And uh, it can, they can then they have been um, um, read as, as, an, as a traumatic act on, on understanding the city and the collective imagination around. Uh, Paris. So um, what else Osman uh, brought uh, in his wake with this, with his streets and big boulevards uh, and axial uh, urban compositions was of course a standardized uh, townhouse, uh, which um, for the first time acquires uh, the, uh, the, 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 the atmosphere of a mass produced object uh, that contributes to the, to the visual cohesion of the city. And uh, against this impetus of uh, towards the rationalization of the, of Osmanian Paris, um, um, in 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 uh, subsequent decades grows slowly uh, a counter counter uh, sorry counter current of of um, individualism and organic form making um, certainly associated with uh, the emergent Art Nouveau. And uh, Louis Bonnier's um, street perspectives, um, looking at how the standardized blocks uh, of, of um, mid 19th century Paris um, can, uh, with the revision of, uh, of, of um, urban regulations uh, in 1902, become much more open, uh, become um, uh, also uh, much more hygienic uh, because uh, there is more access to, to um, air and sunlight. So uh, there is a break with the 19th century city, but at the same time, it's also uh, highly rational and pragmatic. Um, then uh, the, the model for the, for the, for the standards uh, ABMs that uh, are created in, in Paris um, um, crystallizes from two important prototypes. Uh, the first is uh, um, uh, uh, is created by uh, Auguste Lavissière uh, for the philanthropic society Le Groupe de Maisons Ouvrières, um, uh, GMO de Menil, Immeuble de Menil, uh, which, uh, as you can see, um, is, is very much um, in the, in, embedded in the fabric of the Osmanian city. It's a perimeter block um, that is accessed through one point controlled by, uh, by a concierge. Um, the second uh, is uh, a landmark project of uh, Fondation Rothschild, uh, Henri de Prague. Um, and uh, what you see here is uh, once again uh, the uh, ILO uh, of the um, uh, created through, through Osman's works uh, is preserved. The building goes all the way to the, to the perimeter of this ILO, but at the same time, it creates new. Um, breaks into uh, into into the frontages. So there is already a, a tentative sense of breaking away from from the established pre-established order. 
And um, the project was the result of uh, an important competition um, of 1905. Uh, these are the variety is, is obvious in the in the um, some of the first uh, stage entries, and I would uh, I would um, particularly single out uh, Tony Garnier's uh, unplaced project of this uh, first uh, competition. It's it's uh, living proof. Uh, it, it's it's very radical. Um, it completely breaks with with the the the, the street line, and in that it. Um, precedes, uh, it anticipates by several decades, a modernist block. Um, and uh, it is uh, proof of uh, the idea of the competition and the arbitrariness sometimes, or the, um, the, the lack of, um, uh, of uh, pioneering spirits that emerges uh, in, in such events. Now uh, the the winning uh, competition, or the the winning entry, however, is very interesting. Uh, it it presents uh, this is this is uh, designed by Augustin Rey and um, constructed by a collective of architects um, originally laid by Augustin Rey uh, under the umbrella of the Fondation Rochil. Uh, but what it's uh, very clear in the way that the the project is also represented, so you have these airflow diagrams that. Uh, clearly show the, the, the impetus on the hygienist aims of sun exposure and ventilation as primary reasons uh, for this rupture between the building frontage and the perimeter streets um, um, of, of this type of perimeter blocks, um, or no longer perimeter blocks. Uh, and another uh, notable project uh, of 1913, uh, this is Auguste Labussière, so the same author as um, uh, uh, Immeuble uh, uh, Domenil, um, which creates uh, this ensemble en rue de Saïda um, under the uh, edges of the same foundation, now has been renamed uh, Fondation de Madame J uh, Jules Le Body, since uh, the, the anonymous uh, uh, donor has been revealed as being uh, uh, Madame Le Body. And you can see that by this time, so this is 1913, Following the geometry of the street is no longer an issue. Uh, it's much more about the connection uh, between uh, six modular blocks that are that are uh, connected by open staircases. Um, and uh, what I find extraordinary is also the rationalist expression of, of the facades um, uh, with these exposed concrete structures and standardized floor to ceiling openings, which remind uh, me um, of, uh, of residential projects being built even today in Zurich, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and in the end, once um, the, the city decides to step in because uh, this need for, uh, there is a great need for housing that cannot be filled in. Um, uh, there are two concomitant competitions organized by, by the city in 1912 on two sides, uh, Rue Henri Beck and Avenue Emile Zola which results in um, uh, typ typification of, uh, of uh, dwellings. Um, and uh, this, uh, oh, the Office d'Habitation de la Ville de Paris, uh, created in 1912, um, uh, um, uh, shows, shows already how, this, how these types um, cater for different, different types of citizens. Uh, it's it's uh, very much... Uh, um, a paternalistic project uh, in which uh, the, the newcomers into the city uh, have to kind of see, see, be educated uh, how, to, how to use a bathroom, how to use a kitchen, and how to, use, uh, how to, how to live in an apartment uh, before this transition, gradual transition towards, uh, towards the um, uh, um, uh, habitation de loyer mo mo moyenne uh, that, uh, that occurs later. So um, the, the Office Public des Habitations de Bon Marché uh, is, is set up by decree in uh, 1914. Um, and uh, it, it uh, focuses its energies on, um, on this construct, uh, on this sig very significant uh, area of the city that is uh, freed up by uh, the demolition of the city's fortifications following by uh, a, a master plan by Louis Bonnier and Jean-Claude uh, Louis Forestier, uh, which, which uh, show a conflict between uh, unified expression and 
and the reality of uh, piecemeal development. Um, uh, uh, this is a detail. This is a, a detail on the on the uh, south part of the city, and it shows clearly how uh, this uh, HBM uh, and sort of so so uh, affordable housing and and middle uh, mid range housing uh, are oriented towards the city, towards the center of the city, and they're seconded by uh, a very wide swathe of of green space. So this uh, this area um, is, 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 uh, sort of surrounds the city um, and um, it, it makes full use of, uh, of, uh, of the experience and knowledge um, uh, of, of the early experiments that we've gone through. Um, I'm just going to point one out, the Cité Montmartre uh, and the Square Marcel Samba. Uh, so here, uh, we we deal already with uh, the work of um, a, a collective of architects uh, under the edges of the um, of the um, OPE de la Ville de Paris, um, and um, uh, this is this is a, a detail of the same building uh, with uh, with um, a combination of motifs that also reminds of the of the building regulations. Uh, that we we discussed earlier, and uh, a section showing clearly the 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 structure of of the housing uh, en redon, um, meaning having this comb line structure uh, that allows courtyards to be formed. And uh, in relation to uh, to uh, the fortifications, so there is a. Um, a very strong uh, sense of of this of this um, very dense, actually uh, quite quite um, uh, sort of very very strongly grouped apart, uh, grouped together uh, groups of uh, of housing that had a have a very specific expression. And uh, walking around, uh, I was very struck by how they managed to, to evoke uh, the standard block of Osman's uh, Paris um, and uh, its geometry uh, also in, in dealing with this very, very uh, definitive break that they do uh, in, in, um, in opening towards uh, this, uh, this area of the green space at, at the back towards the periphery. So uh, it feels like uh, uh, the Osmanian Paris is very close behind. So um, to conclude, um, I'd like to return to this idea of the historical work in and on architecture and perhaps open uh, with these reflections, the discussion um, and the question uh, to uh, Professor Cohen. So um, I will quote from this uh, conference that I mentioned or from this keynote that he gave uh, when he says, and I quote, historical work on or in architecture operates in a multidimensional space, applying knowledge and methods developed by scholars working on art, technology, ideas, territories, and societies. So how can it be called architectural? Because it uses architectural concepts, but what are these concepts? Are they real concepts in the scientific understanding of the term? It is time to reopen a conversation on this problematic discipline. Um, and uh, the discussion follows with uh, a critique of uh, um, a survey of recent uh, tendencies in research that I think is also worth just going through very quickly. So, um, uh, Professor Cohen, uh, you are Cohen, you are um, uh, uh, discussing the the tendency towards fragmentation that is uh, engendered particularly by um, by monographic studies uh, and the creation of uh, micro histories uh, that are interesting in as much as they contain a micro in a microcosm of an artifact, uh, let's say um, a much wider discourse. So, so they really work when they are the crystallization of ideas rather than uh, the, the um, investigation of an object. Uh, you're also critical, and I really strongly second you here on the 
mediate, mediating dimension of uh, architectural research, that there is uh, a strong, so this is 2016, a strong uh, shift towards media studies uh, that you um, expressed a doubt as to, um, as to uh, it, it takes something out of, uh, of the analysis of architectural artifacts and, and cities. Uh, and you make a strong case for transnational studies and uh, a macro dimension that creates um, the possibility for comparisons, uh, for, uh, for overarching themes. And once again, one, one more quote from this keynote, in all these pieces of my work, I have tried to invent problems and to deploy imagination as I believe, and this is for me a very important point, that interpretive fantasy is one of the most precious features of history and sometimes one of the most ignored. Um, in relation to this, uh, I was reminded, of course, of um, the interpretative leap that is um, advocated by uh, Edward Hallett Carr in his uh, um, uh, historical lecture, What is History? Uh, he argues that interpretation enters into every fact of history and that the historian has a dual task uh, to, to discover significant facts and to turn them into facts of history. So discarding significant facts, there is a, there is a process of processing uh, as, he, as he calls it. So he says that the main work of the historian is basically not to record, but to evaluate and to create a narrative from, from this selective uh, sequence of facts. So he makes three points. One, that history means interpretation. Second, that history depends on uh, the capacity of the historian to make contact with the minds of those, those about whom he is writing, or she. Uh, this text was written in 1961, so uh, the, the implication is the historians are always male. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, uh, the historian is of his, once again, own age and bound to it by the conditions of human existence. So we always have to reflect upon the present in our uh, descent into the past. So with this, uh, I'd like to finish uh, my presentation and hopefully uh, to, to take some of these uh, themes for conversation uh, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, compact and uh, rich summary of um, a detailed study, in fact, of what's, uh, what happened in the Santé Rouge architecturally and from an urban point of view between the uh, mid, late 1850s and early 1920s. And thank you as well for launching the discussion. I think we already have uh, material to ping pong between uh, both of you, but a word to our audience, this is also the moment when you should join as well. So feel free to ask your own questions on the, on the chat in English or in French, and we will introduce them in this discussion. Now, I believe, uh, Professor Cohen, you already have uh, a few questions directed at you uh, in these last few remarks. Perhaps you want to react. Uh, yes, I've not looked at them. Should I look at them in the chat? Uh, uh, oh, no, I, I was uh, referring to the, the questions at the end of uh, this presentation. Oh, yes, yes. I think, th thank you very much, uh, Irina. I think it was, uh, it's, it's great to see you returning to uh, the study of objects which seem to be uh, well known. I'm thinking of a work you, which you're referring to of uh, Marie-Jeanne Dumont, the work of Monique Leb on, uh, on domestic space, uh, uh, which is also really marking. But uh, in a way, people had started uh, ignoring these objects. So you're bringing uh, a new view uh, by focusing on this pro process, which seems to be leading not from the from Lilo to the bar, from the block to the slab, but from Lilo to Lilo, uh, to a sort of revision of, of Hausmann rather than to a negation of Hausmann. And I think your uh, the, the, a competitive work like the one you've done uh, has, uh, I think has never been made. So I'm really very, uh, uh, very interested in looking at it in detail in seeing it very soon in, in book form. Uh, I think, uh, for instance, the adventures of the type Henri Beck, which you mentioned, this uh, apartment type, which is in fact a sort of 
minimal wohnung mm -hmm. ante literam so it's uh, like the minimal wohnung of the 1920s an attempt to say that uh, working class or um, i would say uh, lower level employees housing cannot be a homothetic re reduction of the uh, bourgeois apartment and that other other ideas have to be have to be developed and this will be i think a, a, a theme an important theme for what we usually call the modern movement so i'm curious to see how you might develop this into a, a consideration of a 1920s project uh, uh, elsewhere and uh, to see how if any kind of comparison is possible which is not necessarily always the case we tend to think that the essence of uh, uh, scientificity compa is comparison I'm, I'm not always convinced of that thank you uh, i don't know if this is a question i'm also curious by the way <laughs> <laughs> to see how it pans out uh, so far uh, the comparison has been really about drawing uh, some common themes, but what, what is, of course, there are some common themes as standardization. There's always a financial logic that that is uh, so often the, the bottom line. Uh, there is this uh, process of uh, uh, bourgeois colonization of an uncontrollable workforce, um, but um, Ultimately, what what I find fascinating, what I found fascinating in this uh, in this study is uh, the obstinacy of cultural trait features and how uh, each city develops its own housing culture uh, somehow with, but also against these these uh, these uh, features of commonality. Yes. Uh, and anyway, I think the, the the question of the continuity or absence of continuity with. Uh, the radical architecture of the 20s is significant. Le Corbusier famously considered that this uh, belt of red brick buildings, Ceinture mm -hmm. de Brique Rouge, was 35 kilometers of shame. This is what he writes famously in 1937. So he was firmly yeah. opposed to it, yet, yet I think deep inside his designs, something, there were some echoes of that kind of domestic culture which he, which he absorbed. So how was, after all, what is remarkable, you're, you're working on other building campaigns from Frankfurt to uh, Vienna. Uh, uh, more than 30,000 housing units were produced in less than 20 years. So this uh, has never been uh, equal since. And uh, I think also what one should learn is the, how uh, the, the challenge of quantity, in this case, changes quality. Mm -hmm. And this is not something which has been ever looked at carefully in the case of Paris. So you're on, on the track of uh, bringing new imaginative uh, 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 considerations to what seem to be a very established historical narrative. It's very generous of you, uh, Professor Cohen, but I have to give credit where it's due. And oh, yes. uh, I have really used this work so much. Uh, you mentioned, also, of course, uh, the wonderful books of, uh, of Monica Leb and uh, uh, Marie Dumont, um, uh, but particularly in relation to, to uh, Le Fortif au Perif, I, I find it very difficult to refer to them in any other way. Um, this book has been crucial. Um, and uh, of course, there is a new edition that uh, I think you have also nearby, <laughs> a 30, 30 year uh, celebratory edition. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yes, that is, uh, um, uh, I see you've managed to, to find a series of uh, connections between the two indirectly and not necessarily both, um, both presentations side by side. I would challenge you now to focus on that, which will be quite difficult because we are talking about two different periods, very different geographical areas, different kinds of uh, uh, urban and architectural projects. Uh, so there, there's uh, quite a gap between the two, but there is perhaps one point that um, a, a common platform that I think might produce an interesting discussion. So I have a two part question, one for each one of you on this common platform about drawing. So uh, first, Professor Cohen, I'm wondering, what was Gary's reaction to the rediscovery of these early formative drawings after so many years and after 
uh, so much has changed, not only in the kind of work he produces, but even in the, the methods he uses. What was it like for him to see these, uh, these drawings? What was that rediscovery like? And likewise, um, referring to the, the drawings of uh, Annabelle uh, Fitch uh, in, in this, this project, what was it like to discover uh, these projects, this, this transformation of Paris, as we know from... Um, uh, let's say a written format, but rediscovering it in a drawn uh, format. So looking at these typologies um, as drawings in a way, rediscovering them too. Okay, I'll start. Uh, I think the Frank's relationship, I've, I've discussed every single drawing with him. So this book has been, been through a lengthy process and I'm ready to continue. He's 92 and it's, um, both a blessing, of course, to meet the architect, and at the same time, it's a handicap. And uh, here I would draw some uh, uh, historiographic conclusions. One of the problems I meet is that Frank's reaction sometimes is already contaminated by the narrative of historians. So he's no longer telling you the story of a project, how he developed it, but is repeating what people have said about the process. So it's sometimes difficult to go back to, to, to have a sort of psychoanalytical regression to the uh, moment in which he designed the project. As for the drawings, I think that in, uh, there are several projects among those I've shown which uh, are really deeply disliked by, by Gary today. So he, he, wa uh, he was very clear about moments which seemed to be taking him into dead ends and uh, other projects which were uh, what I would say the, the, uh, the, the, the germ of something different. So uh, I like the freedom he has when he looks back at his work and he's not uh, uh, frozen in a narcissistic posture. At the same time, and here, there's a little bridge to build, an impossible bridge perhaps to, to build with uh, Irina's presentation. Gary was trained in the early 50s by leftist uh, architects at the, at the University of Southern California, by people who were really engaged in, in, uh, uh, in social ideas and social discourse. But at the same moment, social housing was banned as being a sort of red conspiracy against America. And to this day, I perceive in, Frank, in Frank's words, as he defines himself as a progressive, uh, whatever it means in the US, uh, I perceive a certain nostalgia for not having been able to develop this line of investigation in his designs uh, to this day. Very interesting. Uh... It is true, it really is about a, a moment in history uh, when things are possible and available to the architects, no matter what their political convictions might be. Uh, and um, uh, when, when you mention also that, that his own thinking about his own work uh, many, many decades later uh, is already contaminated by the narratives that have been projected on the, from the outside on, on, on these uh, drawings. Um, that also reminds me of that theme uh, that Carr was so aware of, that the historian always writes, uh, the historians always write in their own time. Um, it's impossible to detach yourself from, from the moment. And uh, uh, there's, there's always the kind of deformation. That's why there's no such thing as historical truth, right? Um, because it always, it's always modified uh, through the passage of time. Yes. We have additional questions regarding drawing uh, from Samia. Uh, one I, of her... I can answer to that. Maybe. Uh, yes, sure, yes. sure, of course. No, let's. Uh, we're short of time. Yes, I think Samia, your question is really important. What, uh, what, what was included? What, what was excluded? In some cases, there was no choice. There was there were two drawings for a given project, so I have to take them. In other cases, there were endless variations on the same uh, detail. I had to make a selection. But what guided me was the trying to understand the design process, the uh, initial idea, the germination of an idea, then the transformation of the idea, then possibly crisis in the process, in the process which 
uh, can be documented by written documents, a letter of a client who cuts the budget by half or a, a, a building permit rejected. So there are external causes. And what is uh, more difficult to document are the internal causes. How Gary, which happens and ha happened and happens very often, how Gary changes his mind, uh, gets rid of a drawing, consider it as crap and move to something different. So what I'm interested in are the jumps, are the leaps. You were talking about leaps in the uh, historical interpretation, but there are, as we know, leaps in, uh, in design processes, which are never linear. So this is what I'm interested in, how uh, leap by leap uh, a language has been developed or several languages have, have, have been developed and then abandoned. Uh, can I can I take up from here uh, and ask a question, uh, Professor Cohen? Uh, in relation to drawings, they actually tell a very partial story. Uh, exactly when you're referring to these external causes, like clients uh, or you know various you know uh, the tender comes in, the price is over the top, everything has to change. Uh, do you use also office records in your in your work? Yes. Yes, yeah, I've used, I've used, Gary is, has been a very serious professional in keeping his records, keeping the drawings. Uh, his artist friends told him not to throw any single drawing. So he has thousands of them. I had to work my way through a mountain of paper, a uh, mountain of tubes containing paper and boxes. So correspondence, uh, records of meetings, uh, many, many, many materials, and also interviews with other people from the office. So I believe in some cases I've managed to, uh, within the limits of a book, the, this book is already a monster with 550 pages. So there's just so much I can tell in such a book. But I think I've been able to understand uh, a lot from the, the written records and from Gary's correspondence. So question, this is about what happened bef before 1978. Now I'm on my way to the eighties and when I'll hit the nineties, this will become a big mess. This will become a, a mountain of uh, CDs, uh, of uh, uh, unreadable uh, thermal paper faxes. This will become a mountain of files. And I, I don't know how I will be able to cope with that. Probably I'll, I'll have to, to, to put together a team uh, of people helping me and trying to make sense of the, the digital turn in Gary's work, uh, in Gary's work, because as you know, he was the first, although he, he never touched a computer in his life, he was the first for very particular reasons to introduce the computer widely in, in his practice. And this process, which I will document in volume four, maybe, uh, uh, will uh, take me to completely uh, mysterious horizons. And very different archival practices as well. Yes. It's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. We have uh, uh, one more question still about drawing for uh, uh, Dr. Davido Vici. Uh, why the choice to redraw the floor plans of the buildings uh, you studied instead of using the original plans? Is it because those plans didn't exist or is it because precisely because of this part of a, a historical transformation and interpretation that you just mentioned? Well, I have to give a, a sadly pragmatic rather than conceptual answer to this. Um, the, the books that I have used for information because I have based my research mostly on uh, secondary literature, as you could see, um, have terrible production values. Often, actually, uh, uh, Professor Cohen's book, The Fortifo Berif, is, is a happy uh, exception. Um, uh, there is another um, book, uh, Oe Gaza, Pour tous les étages, or à tous les étages, uh, by, uh, by uh, Jacques Lucan, that also uh, has the same superior production values. However, um, uh, many, many of the books that I found uh, have reproductions that are really at the level of uh, photocopies. So it was really a question of uh, producing these drawings in a way that is, is legible and is to the standard of contemporary publications. On the other hand, I'm also um, uh, thinking, of, so we, we had, I have had four, uh, I have collaborated with four wonderful students, uh, one for each of the cities. 
they've read all the books, they, they sorted all their material, we discussed what uh, should be drawn. And um, what I'm uh, now in the process of doing is uh, a, a, another more comparative basis of producing, producing drawings. So it's mm -hmm. also as a basis to start these comparative studies. Yes, if I may say something on this topic, uh, of course, you have archival uh, documents, you have plants, and we've seen some of them in the archives. They're ver very difficult to reduce and to, uh, to understand. They're very gray. They lack contrast. So I think it's not a very good base for the kind of uh, uh, investigation which, uh, which has been done by Irina. She needed to produce uh, representations. And I would add something about, uh, about uh, uh, history as practiced by the architects. Uh, there is a big difference, which is uh, with history practiced by art historians, which is the ability of architects to produce representations, which are not only illustrations, but become the very material of, of research and interpretation. And in my case for Gary, it's absolutely pointless because the originality of the document is, is uh, the project in the case of Irina, it is a very fundamental methodological strategy. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we should wrap it up to uh, really fulfill the name of the event 2020. Uh, thank you, Archizum, for hosting the event. Professor Cohen, Dr. Davidovici, thank you so much for your uh, great informative uh, presentations and especially for the discussion that you spontaneously produced afterwards. You know, after, it was really a pleasure to, to watch. And for the audience, Thank you for uh, being here. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. The last session of uh, 2020 will be between professors Veronique Patheur and Sebastian Marot. It will take place on the 11th of May at 6.30. I yeah. hope to see you then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, André. André, you, you, um, may, may I just... Uh, uh, intervene because we have the habit of asking uh, to to show a book to finish uh, to propose a book uh, after this uh, long uh, screen sessions. It's always nice to mention books, and uh, um, I wonder if uh, if Irina and uh, Jean Louis, you prepare um, this uh, gift that you can offer to our, our audience of the book. Well, first of all. Uh... As I've shown once, um, but if I could show two books, that would be great. So this this is one of the books, and of course, there's going to be a new edition coming very soon, and finally reorderable. So I'm very happy that I won't have to rely on a library copy anymore. Uh, but also in the same spirit, and uh, to to recall um, uh, the scholars who wrote about housing in the 70s and in the 80s and in the 90s that uh, are uh, are uh, often forgotten now. Um, there is a wonderful book uh, that I found very, uh, uh, I bought it secondhand, also an old copy book, 5% uh, Philanthropy by John Nelson Tan, uh, that looks at much of the housing that's disappeared in London, uh, which was of course in many ways a model for also what happened in, in Paris and in the rest of Europe. Um, so um, it's just, uh, it's just uh, an homage to to uh, the scholars of anonymous architecture that I'd like to, 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 leave, uh, to leave today. Well, as for me, I will go on the, into the direction of, uh, of uh, what I would say architecture and class struggle, architecture and the people. And I will show you a, the last book which I've received, uh, which is on the top of my pile, which is the catalog of a current exhibition at MoMA Reconstructi reconstructions, architecture, and blackness in America, and I think it's a it's a memorable em event to see the Museum of Modern Art, which was a bastion of uh, a high bro and uh, establishment culture, uh, to be finally forced to open its galleries to an alternative view of America's architecture in the past two centuries. So the show has been curated by Sean Anderson, who's 
a curator at the museum, and Mabel Wilson, who is a remarkable historian teaching at Columbia uh, on African-American architecture and other aspects. So I think this is really a milestone. It's a change of orientation, at least in North American, in the history of North American architecture. And I, we, I wanted to salute this, uh, this moment. Well, to my list of thank yous, I have to add these contributions as well. Uh, I hope everyone took note. You have reading material until we meet again for another 2020 on the 11th of May. Thank you very much, everyone, and see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.